now that the housekeeping is out of the way, let's get to the main event. Our speaker today is state park interpreter, Lily Orvitz. Lily Orvitz runs the PORTS program, Parks Online Resources for Teachers and Students, and is the current interpreter lead at Calaveras Big Tree State Park. She earned her major in evolution, ecology, and biodiversity with a minor in U.S. history at UC Davis in 2018. The same year, she started working in outdoor education and interpretation for the Forest Service in Alaska, and over the next few years, worked all over the United States for the National Park Service, county parks, and public outdoor education. She has been at Calaveras Big Tree State Park for about two years. Please join me in welcoming Lily Orovitz. All right, thank you. I'm going to go ahead and spotlight myself for everyone. So I take up your entire screen. And today during this program, I'm going to keep it at least moderately interactive for a webinar. And in doing that, I'm rather fond of polls. So the way these polls are going to work, because I feel like it's safe to assume that some of you are tuning in multiple people on one screen, all these polls will have multiple answers you can choose from. That doesn't mean I want you to vote multiple times for something. That just means I want you to pick the answers that's true for everybody in your group. So we're gonna launch this first poll here just to make sure everything is working okay. And I'm going to launch it and please do vote. The question is, have you ever been to Calaveras Big Trees State Park before? You can answer yep, nope, or maybe. I like to say maybe because I can tell you, I probably don't remember every single place I've been, especially if it was as a little kid. So feel free to vote maybe if you're not entirely sure. Looks like a majority of you already voted. Thank you very much. I'll give you all another about 25 seconds or so to vote to see if we can get all 136 or so of you. Some of those participants are me, so I'm not gonna vote. I know I've been here before. Okay, about 10 more seconds. If you haven't voted, please do. Looks like at least majority of you can see the poll and vote, which is great to see for future polls. All right, I'm going to end it for now. Got the majority and I will share the poll in case you're curious. So a slim majority of you have been here before. So welcome back to Calvary's Big Trees. Just underneath that, about half of you said you've never been here before. So welcome virtually to Big Trees. I think this still counts as at least a partial visit. And then a small portion of you, about 10% of you said maybe, you're not really sure. So for you all, potentially welcome back with a big old question mark. Polls work okay. So another thing I wanna mention is that if you put a question in the Q&A, as was stated before, I will not be answering those until the very end. So maybe hold on to your question until the end in case I've already answered it anyway. If you don't want to forget it, though, it's okay. Just put it in the Q&A for now. We just won't be looking at it until then. All right. So during this program, we're talking about giant sequoias, this really cool tree behind me right here. And we've introduced me. We've said I'm at Calvary's Big Tree State Park. But I wanted to give you more context to where I am because it also actually explains why this giant sequoia is behind me right now. So a moment you'll see my screen and I have it pretty zoomed in to the visitor center. You can see there's a little heart and a little briefcase. I like where I work, what can I say? But I'm gonna zoom it out here to give you some context to where I am in the entire state of California. Maybe you're starting to see some names you know. There's Sacramento, for example. And then I zoomed almost all the way out so you can see pretty much the whole state. And as you can see from this, I'm kind of in the middle-ish of the state, you know? Technically, I am in the Central Valley District of California State Parks. We stretch out pretty wide and pretty far. And I gotta tell you, I'm not in the valley. I am in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Now I'm not way high up. I'm not the tippy most top. I'm not by, you know, Lake Tahoe or any of that. I'm at about 4,800 feet, just shy under 5,000. And the giant sequoia, this tree behind me, is a very, very picky tree. Maybe you're also picky about where you live. I don't know. But this tree is only found in the western slope of the Sierra Nevada mountains between about 4,500 
and 8,000 feet. So if you're trying to go look for a giant sequoia in its natural habitat, you have to go somewhere in roughly this squiggle right here. And that's it. And the whole wide world, this is the only place you're going to find a giant sequoia, naturally. We do actually sell giant sequoia little saplings that you can plant in your backyard. These are from seed that were not harvested from the park. We don't do that. They're harvested from elsewhere in a giant sequoia farm. So you can plant them where you live. It's just not very likely they'll do super well because I really like this environment with some snow in the winter, some moderately hot summers, and definitely a lot of snow melt that soaks into the soil. So if you can pin yourself on this map, you can make a little calculation of how far you gotta go to see a giant sequoia. Hopefully it isn't too far for you. But overall, we're lucky, if y'all are calling it from California, to have this tree within our state because it is quite remarkable. As you might've guessed, it is big, hence the name Calaveras Big Tree State Park, hence the name giant sequoias. But they are the biggest individual tree in the world. And by big, we're encompassing a couple things to get that claim to fame. We're encompassing that's very wide, plus it's very tall, plus it's very heavy. Now this giant sequoia, I'm not gonna get too close to it because we have established a fence around it. I wanna be very respectful of its space. We always ask visitors to stay on the trail and not go off the trail to approach the trees. We wanna let them have room to breathe, but you can just see from a distance, it's pretty wide. I'm gonna ask you to do a little bit of math though. So, you know, turn the person next to you if you're by yourself to do some mental calculations, do some math. My wingspan is about five feet. The very widest giant sequoia right now is just shy of 40 feet across. So do your quick math. How many me would it take to stretch across a 40 foot giant sequoia? Give you a couple moments. Kind of like a, are you smarter than a fifth grader kind of situation. And if you said it would take eight of me to reach 40 feet across, you are correct. So imagine, I mean, we're strict right now with this fence right here. But imagine eight of me stretching across this entire picture frame. Huge. But you have to also include the height and the weight for it to be the biggest tree ever. So let's take a look at how tall this tree is. Again, we're a little bit of a ways away. So you can kind of imagine it being slightly taller with the perspective shift. Let's go all the way to the top. We have other trees in this forest. Those are not giant sequoias. That is why we've already seen the tops of them. And we made it. The very tallest giant sequoias are over 300 feet tall. Now, not all of them are 300 feet tall. They do you tend to stop growing taller once they get past all the other trees in the forest. They just want to have a sun all to themselves. So sometimes they're only 250 feet tall, sometimes they're 275, sometimes they're that 300. The 40 feet though, that's a record that can keep breaking because they do keep growing wider, just not taller. So we have a wide tall tree that has to be really heavy. Giant sequoias, just the trunk, not including all their branches, can weigh over 1,000 tons. And one ton is 2,000 pounds. So if again, do some math there, you know this is a very big, heavy tree. Cool facts, but I'm not doing my job unless we also think about it a bit critically. I'm, I'm an ecologist at heart. I like to think these things through. So. Let's break this down to the basics and then get to specifically what makes a giant sequoia special, allows it to get to be so big. Giant sequoias are plants. So again, talk to the person next to you, talk in your groups, think to yourself, what do plants need to grow? I'll give you about 30 seconds to think about that. So start wrapping up your thoughts and your discussions. All plants need three really key things for photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is when they make their own food. Maybe this is sparking some memories in you. They need air, specifically the carbon dioxide we breathe out. 
they need water and they need sun. This holds true for the giant sequoia. I mentioned that they like to get past all the other trees and get the sun all to themselves. They are sun loving plants. Some plants they're okay in the shade. Maybe of some house plants that they like the shade, they don't need to be by a window. Giant sequoias need that full sun. They love the sun. So they don't do well if it's really shady. We have those, but they also need space. Everything needs space in some capacity. Sometimes it's just really small. But as you can see, there's not a whole lot around this giant sequoia. Part of that's because we only recently put up the fence because we need to stop people from getting too close to it and accidentally damaging it. But part of that's just because they need all the space to grow and get bigger. If the seed land in a location where there's already a bunch of trees, it doesn't have enough space to get it very thick. So those are their main four things giant sequoia needs, especially that sun and that space. But that's not particularly unique to this tree. And they have a secret sauce. Giant sequoias have a lot of time to grow. We all need time to grow, but eventually we stop getting taller. Giant sequoias, they'll stop getting taller, but they won't stop getting bigger as long as they have those four key things they need. Plus, you know, good soil, nutrients and soil, things like that. And they can live and grow for over 3,200 years. So that means the very oldest giant sequoia germinated, which just means it started growing from its seed, it's a sciencey term for it, during the end of the ancient Egyptian empire. So when the pharaohs are starting to lose control of the area, this giant sequoia was a sapling growing up towards the sun. And during the entire rest of human history, this giant sequoia on those good years with plenty of water and sunlight, et cetera, was growing. So that's the entirety of the Romans and the Vikings and the Renaissance era. And that's how you can be as big as a giant sequoia. If you have a lot of time and you have the capacity, you're gonna do it. But that brings up yet another question. We answered how they got to be so big, but if you have to be that big, if we have to be old to be that big, I should say, how can you get to be so old? So giant sequoias have some pretty incredible adaptations in order to get to be so big and old. And an adaptation is any sort of characteristic or trait. So it could be a permanent physical thing like thumbs for humans. It could be a temporary thing. It could be a behavior. So like a cheetah running quickly could be considered an adaptation that helps any living thing survive and hopefully thrive in its environment, live and live really well. So for a giant sequoia, its main focus, you could say, is to live a really long time. And its main adaptation, at least I like to focus on, is the bark, okay? This is a nice up close look at the bark of a giant sequoia. I picked this up off the ground. I didn't take it off the tree. You can see it's this nice reddish color. A lot of people when they come to this park, they ask us if we have redwoods here. Technically, the answer is yes. Giant sequoias are a redwood tree, just like how coast redwoods are a redwood tree. Just like how, if you have the same last name, you're related, likely, right? Same goes for these guys. They're part of the same subfamily. Them plus another tree called the dawn redwood. The dawn redwood is found in China, which means that this redwood, technically subfamily, if we want to get into phylogeny, started when the continents were all together. We know for sure, based off a fossil record, that a redwood tree has been around over 160 million years. So clearly they're doing something right. So we have this red bark. We have some trees that are impressive. Coast redwoods are the tallest trees. This red comes from a group of chemicals called tannins. That's T-A-N-N-I-N-S, tannins and tannins taste really bitter. Maybe you like dark chocolate or red wine or coffee, black coffee specifically. Those have tannins, that's why they are such a dark color. If you don't like those things, then you don't like tannins. Insects have taste buds, often on their feet. And they hate this stuff, they think it's disgusting. They would much rather chew on one of these trees over here that does not have the tannins and therefore they taste okay. So tannins repel not all unfortunately, but some of the bugs that chew on trees. For example, pine bark beetles, they don't go for giant sequoias. 
There is a bark beetle called the cedar bark beetle that, and this is a relatively recent thing that we've known some of giant sequoias. So far, we haven't really attributed them to giant sequoia deaths, but we're monitoring them and we're a bit worried, but we're crossing fingers that it's gonna be okay because we have seen some on our giant sequoias, but our natural forest folks say that we don't have to worry about it at this point because the trees still look very healthy. So just cross your fingers for us that the tannins keep doing their jobs and repel most of the insects. But they don't only repel insects, they also repel disease and fungi, which if you know much about trees, trees can get disease and die and suffer just like how unfortunately we can. And fungi can cause rot, it can also spread disease. So the fact that this one component, the tannin repels three different things means it's really key to this tree survival. I talk about the coast redwood, they can live up to 2000 years. So it's really key to have this within this redwood family. Now that's just one component. I haven't even talked about the other adaptations yet. So get, get ready. We still have to talk about the bark itself. By that, I mean how thick it is. The very bottom of a giant sequoia, the bark can be two feet thick. That's the length of my arm. The bark is basically the skin of the tree. So go ahead and give yourself a little pinch. Don't hurt yourself. You can easily feel how thin your skin is. So imagine instead if the bark, or if your skin, I should say, was two feet thick, like giant sequoia bark. You definitely couldn't pinch it. You probably would never have an injury ever again. And that's the same idea for the giant sequoia. Now it's only that thick down low because in the past, fires the giant sequoias would experience would be mostly down low. They're called surface fires. Nowadays, through a variety of things, such as our own interference with the environment, by our, I mean, the people in charge of the forests, fires have gotten worse. Part of that is drought linked to climate change. Part of that is fire suppression practices. Part of that is logging practices in places that aren't protected like this. Overall, fire's gotten worse and it's gone to the very tops of the trees. Giant sequoias can't usually make it if it gets to the very top. At the top is all the cones and needles of the tree. And if those go away, they're not very likely to come back. But the fire stays low and encounters that bark. It's hard for it to burn through two whole feet of wood, even though if it is super hot and it does burn all the way through. Even if it burns through the middle of the tree, as long as it stays low, the giant sequoia can still survive. Now, I know my connectivity isn't awesome, so I'm gonna show you this video and I very much expect it to be blocky. So don't worry about that, but you'll still get a great impression of this tree. This tree is called the chimney tree. It is a tree found in the South Grove. I'm currently in the North Grove. We have two groves of giant sequoias. This one is no connectivity of any kind, so I can't do the program from there. But this tree is completely hollow. If you look through it going this way, and if you stand in the middle and look up, you can see the sky. This tree was burned, we're not even sure how long ago, which means well over 150 years, but still doing its thing. And I'm gonna pause this video at the very top of the tree so I can prove it to you. All right, let me circle these living branches here. We've got some living branches there and living branches there. And as you can even see, we have a bit of a gap right here where there is no tree. It probably got hit by lightning at some point. Being the tallest trees around, they're gonna get hit by lightning, but they're just so big. That's okay if a chunk of their top falls off because they still have some more branches and needles to keep themselves going. And this burn didn't get all the way up there. So this tree is still surviving. Not only that, but it is starting to slowly heal itself. This lighter tan bit that I'm circling right now, it's maybe a little hard to see. That's, it's slowly sealing it over. Now it will never bring back the middlemost part of the tree. That bit technically is dead. I say it in quotes, it's inside of living tree, but it's not doing anything except keeping the tree structurally sound. It helps keep the tree upright. With it gone, this tree is more likely to fall over from like a windstorm or something but it doesn't technically need it to survive. So eventually this tree might completely seal over its wound and we'd never even know it's hollow until it eventually fell over and died. It's pretty remarkable. 
Now I talked about it falling over. If you look at this tree and you think about it, it's basically a ginormous tower. So I want you to yet again, talk to the person next to you, discuss if you were to build a really tall, straight tower like this one, like this tree, how would you build it? What sort of building materials would you use? What sort of shapes would you use? Discuss, I'll give you maybe like 30 seconds. So like last time, think about how you'd build a nice big tower. Okay, so if I know it was me and I was building a nice big tower, I'd use strong materials like wood, which <laughs> giant sequoias are made out of wood, so that's pretty easy. I'd also make sure it's structurally sound at the base. Having a nice big base helps make sure if you have something tall, it's not going to fall over. You can just see from this tree that it gets skinnier as it goes up a little bit and then it curves out, especially on this side. It's a nice big curve out. Giant sequoias are a little bit like the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Now you do need to add a bit up here for branches and for needles and all that. So we'll add a little bit of a fluff up here, but it still has that nice arch down. But we're not seeing the full story. All plants that grow in the ground have roots in the ground and you can't see all the roots. Technically, you actually might be able to see a little bit of them poking up on the ground here, but overall we can't see them. And they're the real structural integrity of these trees. They really help make sure they stay upright. The widest root diameter I found was 300 feet across, okay? These trees spread out for ages. They don't have one really big, strong tap root. Those are the roots that often go really deep into the soil. They're focused instead on making sure they have small mat-like roots that kind of intermingle with each other and spread out across a really wide surface area to again help keep them upright. We get lots of snow, we get winter storms, we get summer storms, and this makes sure that they can withstand all of that. And if there is a flood, if there is some sort of issue with the soil, they're so spread out they can find other better parts of the soil they don't have to worry about as much. Now, this does not mean that this tree crowds out everything in a 300 degree, or 300 degree, 300 foot diameter, right? We have trees back here that are a lot closer than that. So I'm now gonna talk a little bit about what lives with this tree. I'm gonna turn my camera around here so you can see more of this area. Now I will say my conductivity has been very strange this week. I tested out this pathway of walking. So hopefully we'll all stay together. If I don't though, I will do my best to come back. But let's take a little walk and take a look at what else lives alongside this giant sequoia in a mixed conifer forest. Now conifers, are like this tree right here. I'm gonna turn you around just a little bit so you can see they have needles. And these needles can be a variety of shapes and sizes. They can be kind of big, they can be kind of little. They often look like they could come from like a shrub or something. But that's not the only thing that lives here as you can see from this more leafy plant that is a dogwood. Dogwoods are a mix between a shrub and a tree. It kind of depends on who you ask, but they lose their leaves in the fall. So that means they're deciduous. Conifers, they have cones, they have needles, and they're often evergreen. So on, a, a common misnomer people say is that conifer and deciduous are opposites. That's technically not true. Evergreen and deciduous are opposites. Conifers and broadleaf, because the leaves are broad, are the opposites. So. We have these guys that stay green year round, and we have these that turn colors in the fall. We also have a variety of animals I like to call this area home. Most people ask us about our black bears. We do have a bunch of black bears. Right now, they're not very active, but in the summertime, many visitors report seeing them 
luckily for us, we're not quite at the point where we're too worried about them in terms of interacting with people because our visitors have been very responsible with their food and they have locked them away when they're not eating. If you leave your food out, it's likely the bear is going to find it and eat it and then associate people with food. And we don't want that because that's when bad bear interactions happen. But we have bears, we have squirrels, we have many different kinds of birds like woodpeckers and owls and ravens. We have snakes, frogs, many insects, the list goes on. You kind of get the point. And all of them rely in some way, shape or form on all these different trees and things here. So I mentioned conifers. They have cones, they have needles. These cones can be good food for the animals. And now we're gonna play a little bit of a game where I'm going to show you four different cones from four different kinds of conifers that we have here. I'm gonna show them to you all first and I'm going to launch a poll or want you to vote for which one you think came from the giant sequoia. Cones carry the seeds of a conifer tree. So you can think about it as like the fruit of the tree. So just like how trees can have very different fruits, same goes for the conifers with their cones. All right, we have the very first cone. We have cone number one. It's pretty prickly. You see these little like spikes right here? They do hurt if you hold them too aggressively. We have cone number two. We have this one. Very smooth, like a little ball. You could play catch with that if you really wanted to. We have cone number three, Cisco. Like a little W. And then we have the last cone, we have cone number four. Okay. So I'm going to launch the poll now. I would like you to vote for which cone you think came from the giant sequoia. And as you're voting, I'll just very quickly remind you what they look like. We have one, we have two, we have three, and we have four. I'll give you all another, maybe just over 30 seconds or so. I see some of you haven't voted yet. I wanna give you the opportunity to vote. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop the poll and share the results. All right, it looks like cone two, with not a huge margin, but with a few votes is the number one at 39%. Cone four, just edge out cone three with votes with 27% of you. Cone three has 25% and cone one has 9%. So every cone got a vote, which is, you know, share the love, right? All right. If you would humor me, I would like a drum roll for the grand reveal of which cone is the giant sequoia cone. The real giant sequoia cone is number two. The majority have it here. This indeed is the giant sequoia cone. Now, if you have lived or visited a redwood park before, or seen a redwood tree, I should say, coast redwood tree, you might notice that it is similar. The coast redwood tree 
maybe about a third the size, but very much the same shape. Another clue they're related. But it is pretty remarkable, if you ask me, that this is the cone that carries the biggest, the seeds of the biggest tree ever. It's not the biggest cone, you know, size comparison here. It's not the weirdest cone. It's this like egg ball shaped cone. But there is a reason behind this. And it has to do with, surprise, surprise, adaptations and seed survival. I said the giant sequoia can live with all of these things. It's not like the roots crowd out everything, but that doesn't mean it wants to live with every single one of these. It wants to outcompete them with their seeds. So I will be talking about that, but I don't want to leave you hanging. I want to tell you what these other cones are. This is a ponderosa pine cone. And ponderosa has prickly cones, which I mentioned here, right? The little spikes. So prickly ponderosa. I'm going to try to show you the barks of these trees as I walk to our next stop. Um, the lighting might not be so great and it's possible I'll lose connectivity, but I'll try to show you the bark of these various trees. So you can do a little ID if you want to. But ponderosa pine bark is also very puzzle piece, I like to call it. There's some very obvious chunks to it. So puzzle piece, prickly, ponderosa. And we also had a number of votes for, we'll talk about cone number three first. Cone number three, just edge out cone four, but cone four I think is pretty cool. This is the incense cedar cone. And actually, this little guy right next to me right here is an incense cedar tree. They can have kind of reddish bark. I shouldn't say they can. They do have reddish bark, just not when they're little like this. So they are actually a distant relative of the giant sequoia. If coast redwoods were direct relatives like siblings, this would be maybe a second cousin, you know, part of the family tree, technically part of the cypress family, if you're interested in phylogeny. Oh, and one thing you didn't mention that I like to say is how these cones work. So these are cones that are considered open. All cones start out as green when they're on top of the tree. Each one of these is called a scale. Scales are faced upright, heavy and green, full of water. And then when it dries out, or let's say an animal opens the cone up or something else happens, it will crank open like this, create like a little door, a little opening, and the seed will come out from inside. So when I said an animal might be eating it, many animals like to chew on our various cones here, the birds and the squirrels in particular, but this is what it looks like after ponderosa pine cone has been chewed up. I like to consider corn on the cob. They don't eat all of these scales. They like to peel them off like your husky and corn and then eat the seeds inside and leave them looking like corn on the cob, right? But without the corn, just the cob left. So this is another great reason why you should leave cones and anything you find in the forest in the forest. You might think, hey, this cone looks really cool when I take it home. But we already said it has seeds in it, and we don't want you to take the seeds out of the forest. It's also a really important food source for the animals here. So please, please, please don't take cones out of the forest. Leave them behind. And especially when it's in a state or in a federal forest, there are some rules about that. So you could get in trouble, besides just morally getting in trouble. Tangent aside, incense cedar cone starts out green, closed up like this pops open and the seeds come out of the little holes right there. All right, now we have the big one that a fair number of you voted for. Whenever I do school groups, this almost gets all the votes. This is the sugar pine cone. And this is, or I should say this tree produces the longest cones of any conifer. So this does break records and this can also be called the widow maker tree. When this cone is green and all of its scales are going this way, it's also full of water, so it's very heavy. And these are the biggest pine trees, so they can also be pretty tall. And the cones are also the very top most part of the tree. So it would really hurt if this fell on your head. Never heard of it happening here, but you know it's happened at some point. And one nice thing about this cone being so big is it really shows where the seeds are. 
these little divot right there, that's where the seed hangs out. It is basically a pine nut. So if you've ever eaten pesto or eaten pine nuts before, you've pretty much had a sugar pine cone seed, okay? And just like the ponderosa pine cone, this is a wonderful food source for animals, even more so than the ponderosa pine cone. Because think about how huge this is. If you're a squirrel and your body takes up, not including the tail, maybe half of this cone, this will set you up for ages in the winter time. And I have seen a little squirrel called the Douglas squirrel tackle a full grown scrub jay, which are, you know, moderately sized birds, just to get at one of these cones. They'll take it, they'll pull it along with as much force as they can and bury it in different parts of the park. And that's how you get sugar pine trees. So I like to say that this is a great example of how these cones are very similar to fruit because fruit exists. So animals will take them, move the seeds all over the forest, bury them somewhere, forget about them, maybe poop them out and have some extra fertilizer with the seeds, right? The same concept for these conifers but not for all of them because the giant sequoia likes to be a special little thing. And it's not all about the animals. There are a couple animals, Douglas squirrel, mentioned before, and the longhorn beetle that will chew on the cone and release the seeds that way. But it doesn't rely on those animals to spread the seed. It is instead all about the wind. Think about it. These cones are 300 feet up, let's say. They'll be green, but then dry out, open up these cracks and release their seeds. That's a lot of air space to travel. And as you can see just today, it's a little bit breezy. So might as well make your seeds as small and as lightweight as possible so they can catch the wind and float around like a dandelion. The dark stripe down the middle of these seeds is like the seed component itself that actually grows into a tree the lighter tan on either side, that's what we call the wings of the seed. It helps it catch the air, like the puffy part of a dandelion and float all over. Each of these cones contains about 150 of these seeds and max about 200. And each big old giant sequoia can have well over 10,000 cones on top of each tree. So, they know this is necessarily the best way to make sure the seeds are like, you know, buried under the ground like an animal doing it. But they instead banking on having a bunch of seeds, having them be really small and lightweight and just sending them out in the wind and crossing fingers. I say that, but that's actually not true. They don't just cross their fingers. They are strategic. They know a really good time to release their seeds. They will dry up and release their seeds. Oops after signs of smoke and heat, after signs of a wildfire. Think about it, what happens after a fire? Burning up some of these plants, probably not all of them, right? If we're going for a surface fire, the one that stays down low, but burning up some of these plants, burning away what we call the leaf litter. So the needles and the bark piece and all that on the ground, burning those and putting the nutrients back in the soil. So you're enriching the soil more quickly than normal decomposition. You're opening up more space. And because the space is now open and some of these things are gone, you're letting in more sun. I told you before, the two key things giant sequoias need besides time are space and sun. So they do a whole lot better after a fire than otherwise. Unfortunately, fire has been in a tricky relationship with giant sequoia forest for a while. So we're gonna go back in time a little bit. We're gonna go back to the early 1900s. At that point, a lot of California was uh, settled by new people, not the Native Americans, for here was the Miwok and Washoe, still is. And forestry practices were changing. Giant sequoia forests used to have a fire every about seven to 25 years, but Railroads were happening, people were smoking, fires were happening everywhere, and people were terrified of them. So they said, no, zero tolerance, zero tolerance fire policy, not allowing any fires at all, even the natural ones from lightning. That means for us like this one, some of them haven't had a fire in well over 100 years. So if you're in a forest east of fire, let's just say every 10 years, 
and then you squash it and there's no fire at all, that means we're going to have a lot more plants than there used to be. Some of these used to get burned up and that was okay. That was a natural cycle of things. That would enable the growth of other plants. So now we have too many plants, especially the ones that really like the shade because they're taking advantage of it. And if you have too many plants, that means there's more competition for resources like water and space, of course. Add into that climate change. Climate change, when we um, get rid of fossil fuels or burn fossil fuels, I should say, like coal, oil, and gas, and put in the atmosphere and increase the temperature. If it's hotter, it's more likely to burn. Also, we're changing our ocean currents with climate change, and that means our weather patterns getting all messed up. So there's been more intense droughts. So add into it drought, more trees, they're even more stressed than they would be. And of course, the fact that fire has been suppressed for so long, we have so much fuel here, that means we're gonna have these really big, intense, massive fires. Now, luckily this year, we had such a wet winter, at least right here, we were okay. Past few years, this park's been okay as well. But if you go back to 2020 and 2021, the fires that happened down in the Southern part of Giant Sequoia range, up to 19% of all giant sequoias died from those fires. It's bad. And this is again, partially because of fire suppression, creating lots more fuel and competition and from climate change. Now I'm gonna get to climate change in a moment, but I do wanna talk about fire suppression because we are now doing the opposite. I'm guessing a lot of you have heard of this before. We're doing prescribed burns. You'll see in a moment, a picture of one of our prescribed burns we did, not this May, but the May before. I was able to get pretty close to it because it was pretty safe, which I appreciated. And as you can see, we're lighting this ourselves. Prescribed burns are very, very specific. They're called prescribed because it's just like when a doctor prescribes you medicine. It's only supposed to be taken at a specific time, a specific dosage, if you're feeling a certain way. This fire only happens if it's not too wet, not too dry, not too windy, the fuel load's just right. So many things need to be considered. And that's the job of our burn boss, Ben. He's really cool. I really like him. And he is the guy. He knows giant sequoias and fire like nobody else. So we burn to get rid of this fuel, make sure we don't have another really big intense fire, but to also promote the growth of baby giant sequoias. Because we don't have many baby giant sequoias. Most of the ones we have are either before we had the last wildfire about 100 years ago, or in parts where we have done prescribed burns. So we're actually hoping to do two prescribed burns in the North and South Grove this year in the fall. We've had such a wet winter, and we actually had a pretty wet summer with lots of August rainstorms that the conditions are just right. And actually, you might have been hearing little bits and pieces through the headphones of like work happening. We're doing work to make sure that when the fire is done, it's safe, and our giant sequoias are also as safe as possible. So that's one really big thing we're doing to try to protect our trees. Now, one thing I want you guys to do to protect these trees, I do not want you to start any fires. That would be very counterproductive. But I'd like you to help out with climate change, which is a really big, scary concept. But I'm going to give you a very easy task you can do and your community can do. And that task is food waste. If you waste the food you have, then all of the agricultural stuff that went to growing it, which is not so much directly tied to climate change, but there can be some major issues with agricultural runoff, with practices using various kinds of pesticides. So overall, not always great, but there is definitely fossil fuel use and climate change impact from the transportation to the processing of and transporting to the grocery store. And if it goes into the dumpster, that also contributes to climate change. So please, have less food waste, up to 30% of food is wasted in the United States, not just on our end, that's also for like big corporations, big food processing plants, that sort of thing. But do what you can. If you can't eat it, donate it, give it to somebody else or compost it, and maybe just buy a little less and you'll end up saving money anyway. So it's kind of a win overall. So that's something you can do. I also want you to spread the word on prescribed burns. But now I'm gonna take us to our past and how we are continually learning from what we used to do here in this forest. I'm doing this at the very end because this is where I've lost connectivity recently. 
Uh, so cross your fingers for me, that will be okay. I'm gonna go ahead and launch a poll here to occupy you as I'm walking to this location. It's a pretty standard poll. I just wanna see what you all are gonna say. And let's walk and see a little bit of this park's history and what we used to do and how we've learned from it. Thank you all for voting. I appreciate it. You might be able to see what I've been talking about through the trees now. Gotta make sure there's no cars around while I cross. Okay, so far so good. So let me shut up shop here. Oop. And I'll end the poll. And surprise, surprise, looks like everybody said yes. Thank you for that. I appreciate it as a young person. Whatever you can do to help with climate change is always appreciated. And whatever you can do to learn from the past is also appreciated like this right here for those of you who've been here before you might remember this is the discovery stump or the big stump formerly the discovery tree this tree was the first tree to spark interest from all over the world in giant sequoias before then the only people who knew about them were the miwok and washa like i mentioned before and all the other tribes that live in the giant sequoia range the gold rush happened. More people started coming to the area. We had a very successful gold mining town called Columbia. Maybe you've heard of it. Columbia State Historic Park is a pretty popular place to go. It's not too far from here. So while that was booming in the late 1840s and into the early 1850s, more and more people started going up the mountain to look for supplies to support those gold miners. And this tree was the one that people believed. There are reports of people saying giant sequoias were importing them before this tree in 1852. But this was the one where a man named Dowd was able to convince his friends to come over here and see this tree. And then word spread and people actually, for the most part, believed it. So this place has actually been a tourist attraction to see these trees since technically like one year later, 1853. And therefore, we are the longest running tourist attraction in California. Quick fun fact for you. No problem is, you might know us. This is not a tree. This is a stump. We're talking early 1850s. If you want to make money off of something, the morality and the mentality back then was very different. So was the modes of transportation, the modes of sharing. Pictures were not so much a thing, right? It's really hard to get up here. Also, if you've ever driven up here, it's a tight and windy road. Imagine if you didn't have a vehicle and there weren't any roads, and by the way, Sometimes we have snow half the year. It's not gonna be a fun time. So it makes more sense, people back then said, to cut down the tree, strip of its spark, and ship bits and pieces of it to museums and exhibit halls all over the world so people pay money to see the exhibit and not need to travel very far. This happened to this tree, and it happened to one other tree called the Mother of the Forest. You'll see a picture in a moment of the Mother of the Forest spark displayed on the crystal in the Crystal Palace in London. This was a giant exhibit hall. It's kind of like the World's Fair, right? The place people would go to see things from all over the world. And what they would do with the bark, they would label them and then fit them together with those labels, like a giant jigsaw puzzle, so people can get the experience of a big tree like the giant sequoia. Now, ironically, not this particular exhibit, but other exhibits, People said it was fake. They didn't believe this was a real tree. 
So not a lot of money was made off of all of these different exhibits. Kind of ironic and a little bit of karma because you should never cut down these trees. But I will say there is a bit of a silver lining here. Because this tree was cut down, because of the mother of the forest had the bark stripped away from it, people grew to know these trees and they were upset that something so amazing was cut down. And they began to get curious and want to see these trees for themselves. Now, it was not good news for the Native Americans here, the Miwok and the Washoe. But very soon after the trees cut down, a hotel was set up. People started coming here and became a resort. And the trees were protected because instead of making money off of cutting them down, they want to make money off of people coming to see it. So it's a little bit twisted, but it does mean that we have a lot of really um, protected, I suppose I should say, giant sequoias. And from the get-go, people try to make this a more protective federal land. We actually almost became a national park in the 1870s before that was even a thing. But it didn't work out and eventually became a state park in 1931. And we've been one ever since. And all the big giant sequoias, so we're talking like 1,000 to 3,000 years old plus, I should say, are on protected lands, whether it's state or federal. So I'm going to take us on top of this stump here, hopefully. We keep up with the connectivity so you can get a sense of the size of this tree and also join in on the millions of people throughout well over 170 years, I suppose at this point, that have this experience themselves. All right, let's set you right here. You're on one edge, I'm gonna walk to the other side. It looks like Lily Orvitz has cut out for a moment, so please bear with us while she's able to reconnect. Thank you. Don't know where I got cut off, but what I was going to say is that this tree was 1,244 years old when it was cut down. So we don't know exactly how tall it was. Maybe it was 275 feet, maybe it was 300 feet when it was about 30 feet across. But to be that big at a relatively young age, in quotes, right, that means it was growing very quickly. So this might have been the biggest tree ever if we never cut it down. It's a sad thing to have happened. We'd much rather this tree stayed alive, but at least it didn't die for nothing, right? The point of history is to learn from it. That's what we're doing with prescribed burns and that's what we're doing with climate change. So now I'd like to take whatever questions you all may have. I'm grateful that I am back and there wasn't too long of a gap. Thank you, Lily Orvitz, for the fantastic and interactive presentation about the giant sequoias. Um, yeah. Now we'll open it for, up for questions for you. Um, if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box. Mona, did we have any questions that came in during Lily's talk? Yes, thank you so much, Lily. This has just been so exciting and great to be there with you today. And we do have quite a few questions. Um, 
the first question, there's a couple that are related, so I'm going to group them together. This, since you were talking about uh, prescribed fires, we have one question, um, a follow-up question. Uh, it says, a follow-up I have, though, is that my understanding is that CAL FIRE and U.S. FIRE have different philosophies on the use of prescribed fires. Does that get in the way in trying to conduct the prescribed fires? So since we're a state park, we actually don't work with any federal firefighting crews. We do communicate. We're right next to Stanislaus National Forest. We do communicate with them, but we don't uh, share crews. We keep our crews separate. So we're only Cal Fire or our very own state parks crew. Um, you might have seen as I was walking along, I'm not sure how well the connectivity was, some like bits and pieces, some people walking around. That is our own natural resources fire crew. that are working on it, but we don't use federal fire fighters. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for clearing that up. Okay, um, so I do have this next question. What is the dispersal radius of the cones from the giant sequoia? You know what? That's a great question. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, but based off of where we find some giant sequoias, most of them are within groves. They don't tend to go very far. They tend to stay kind of clumped together. There are occasional rogue trees that it could have been like an animal picked up the cone. I mentioned that some squirrels like to nibble on the outside of the cone. They might have been their own independent thing. But they tend to be within a grove. And for example, our grove just behind me right here, the North Grove, the loop that goes around a fair portion of it is about two miles all the way around. So if you want to do a little bit of math there, you can kind of judge exactly how widespread it is. It goes maybe another mile or so total past that, but they tend to be kind of clumped together. So they don't tend to go very far. Okay, great. Is that because they know where they'll grow best? Or do you think? I'm not really sure. I think it's just worked out for them. Okay. Uh, the general rule for evolution and adaptations and all that is as long as it works, it works. They don't need to be the best at anything. Sometimes mm -hmm. you'll get the biggest trees ever. And she's like, wow, that's amazing. But usually what's good enough is good enough. Um, it is kind of for the detriment of these trees at this point. Giant sequoias used to be spread all over this continent. They've been around for ages. The climate used to be different, but they've now been restricted to just the slope. And, and since they don't tend to spread their wings very far, um, they are technically an endangered species just because there's such a limited space. They don't spread out much further. And unfortunately, with those fires I mentioned, there's only about 60,000 of them total right now. So it's not, it's not exactly great that they only use the wind. It kind of be best if they could spread even further, in my opinion. Right, right. Wow. So they are technically endangered species. Okay. They are technically endangered species. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay, um, the next question. So you talked about um, the root system and how far it grows wide, but how, how deep do these roots go? Great question. So this is going to sound deep, but if you know plants, you know it's not too deep. On average, the max is about five feet deep, which mm -hmm. if you know like grasslands, they can have roots that are 20 feet deep. They have some really hardcore anchoring structures there, but these trees, it's pretty shallow. Um, I didn't mention this to you all, but we like to tell people to stay on the trail. I mentioned to you earlier why we have the giant sequoia over there fenced off. We just don't want people to step on the roots. If too many people do that. It can cause what's called compression on the soil. So it's harder for water to get down in there. And so it's harder for the roots to uptake that water to bring it to the rest of the plant. Okay, that's a great answer because um, I had actually had this question. I had read somewhere that... Um, that walking around the base of a, se a sequoia can cause it harm. Is that because the roots? Yeah, so yeah. honestly, it impacts a giant sequoia, but also impacts all the other plants. We love this tree, but we care about everything else too. And there's lots of critters that live on the ground there they might be stepping on. Plus it could be seeds from other smaller plants they don't have to worry as much about. So just for example, I haven't really showed you all the ground here yet, but we have some, you can kind of see in the shade, what we call trail plants. We have lots of flowers here. They like to grow around the, the base of giant sequoia too. So we don't want you to step on the soil to interfere with their growth either. Okay, so the actual stepping on the soil can be a problem. Okay, great, Yeah, it's good to know. Thank you. Um, oh, we have several comments too complimenting you. I have more questions, but this is one that says, Lily, you're a brilliant lecturer. Thank you so much, love it. So we get, we get a lot of group. I just want you to know we've had several of those <laughs> and oh, I've, thank been, you. I've been answering them and uh, people really are appreciating your enthusiasm and um, 
they say that you're doing an awesome job out there. Okay, so back to the questions. Um, why are the giant sequoias only in the Western Sierras? Or to put another way, is there anywhere else in the world with a similar altitude rainfall and sunlight where they could thrive? This is yeah. an interesting question, I think. It's a yeah. great question. So yes, and the reason why they're restricted here, I kind of mentioned before, the theory is just throughout the time of the continent shifting all over and climates changing, they just migrated to only being this little sliver. There are some theories also to do with glaciers and mm -hmm. that maybe the glaciers push them over here. That's just a theory, we're not really sure. In terms of other locations, there's actually a grove in Scotland that's doing Ooh. very well. I don't know so much about if the elevation is just right, but I guess the moisture content is just right. Uh, some of those groves were actually planted in the late 1800s because it became a big fad for wealthy people to take giant sequoia seeds and plant them in their estates. Uh -huh. uh, so there you go. At the very least, I know Scotland has a pretty successful grove, even though it's not native. Oh, that's that's pretty fascinating. Um, so we still have several questions and let's see our time. Okay. Um, since you talked about planting sequoias, and we have a couple of questions related to that. So mm -hmm. you had mentioned that people can buy the saplings and, and put them, one, one, one question is, can you put them in your backyard? And I'm thinking you need a really large space, right? If you're going to plant this yeah. kind of tree. So there's yeah. oh, some landscaping questions um, about the space you would need and um, also how much a sapling might cost. If yeah. You have any idea? Ooh, the cost of the sapling. I haven't been in the store recently to see the cost of the sapling. So unfortunately I can't answer that one. Um, I just see them in the store window. So I'm not really okay. sure how much they cost <laughs> now. Uh, but in terms of putting them backyard, I like to tell people when they ask me this, you can put it there because it's not going to impact you. It's going to impact someone <laughs> who might live there like 500 years from now. Right. So the fa the giant sequoias can grow pretty fast. The first thing they grew is grow tall and then they grow wide. Their number one goal is to reach the sun. So actually, I like this spot. So I'm glad that at least I have connectivity here. This kind of twiggy tree we're looking at right now. So let me I that one. That's a giant sequoia. It's just young. First oh. thing they do is grow tall. So they can grow two feet up and one inch out in a year if they have absolutely prime conditions, enough water, enough sun, et cetera. So you're just gonna deal with this for a while. And then eventually you're gonna deal with them getting wide. But they start out pretty skinny, like a standard, any other kind of conifer tree. I realized I didn't point out all the conifers like I said I would, but I don't wanna risk my connectivity at this point. But it might be standard, like maybe these widths, for a while, so you don't have to worry about it. It just depends if you want like your grandkids to live there, they might have to worry about it. Okay. Or great grandkids. <laughs> <laughs> so there are saplings. And then there was another question, are the cones that are sold in stores problematic at all? Or yeah, not, so, yeah, so they're not, and we actually sell them as little saplings because it's very, only about 1% of giant sequoia seeds that come out of the cone actually make it. So once you get to a saplings one, it's like, okay, it's, it's pretty likely this tree is going to make it overall. Um, it's not problematic just because we don't collect the seeds or grow the saplings here. We actually have, or not we, but there is a giant sequoia farm in a place nearby called Murphy's. It's about 15 minutes down the mountain a little bit. And that person grows them if they want giant sequoia Christmas trees and all that. You have to have certain permits and regulations to do those sorts of things to the dangerous species. Mm. But if you're not doing it on federal, state, whatever protected land, as long as you have those agreements, it's okay. I don't know if we get our saplings from that person. But I know we get them from a giant sequoia tree farm. So that's, that's more or less okay. Um, you should check with your... Um, local like garden and club or local people who would know those things before you plant it in your backyard to make sure it won't cause a problem in the future. These guys a little less so because they're not super successful with their seeds. <laughs> um, but for any time you're planting something that's not native to your area, double check with your local authorities, I'll just say, and make sure it's not gonna cause a problem and cause invasive issues elsewhere. Okay, that's, that's great advice. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so our next question is, uh, how does the giant sequoia trunk carry water so high into the tree? It's not just gravity, is it? Yes. Uh, I actually just did a little program on this. So thank you for asking me. Transpiration. So if you know respiration, just say trans and then do the paration as well. All plants do this. Giant sequoias do this too. It's basically a vacuum. 
So if you've ever drunk through a straw before, which most of us have, what you're doing is creating a vacuum, an empty space, and nature hates an empty space. It panics and wants to fill that empty space with something. So for your straw, your straw is in whatever drink you're drinking, let's just say water, so it'll suck up that water into your mouth. For giant sequoias and other plants, we'll just go to the very top of this incense cedar next to me right here. At the very top, at their leaves or their needles for these guys, they will breathe out air and breathe out water they don't need. So oxygen specifically, I should say, and water. And when they do that, they're creating a vacuum inside themselves and it's specifically inside their xylem. And because there's a vacuum inside, their roots are like, oh my God, I need to fill this with something. So they find water and the water comes shooting up and it goes all the way up to the top of the tree that way. Wow. Just like a straw. Wow. And that was called tra transpiration? Transpiration. Yes. Transpiration. That's our big and word of the day. <laughs> that's the big word of the day. And <laughs> if you've ever been to a tropical forest or if you've been to like a cloud forest, anything like that, a lot of the fog and the wet there is because there's so many trees transpiring and getting rid of their water that it just hangs in the air. Mm, okay. Oh, that's so interesting. Wow. Thank <laughs> you. That was a great question. And mm -hmm. there's there's a, a similar question. And I'm sorry if you've answered this already, but so if it's a young tree, what drives its growth while the tree is young and does not have all that sunlight exposure yet? Is it just reaching for the sun? Is it just encoding? Yeah, it's for the most part reaching for the sun, but often a giant sequoia just won't make it if there's not a lot of open sunlight, to be honest with you. Um, like I said, less than 1% or about 1% of the seeds actually make it into there's no full grown giant sequoias because they don't stop growing as long as they have all they need, but a full grown giant sequoia, we'll just say in quotes. So it just might not make it. So this giant sequoia nearby me here, it's probably doing okay because we're right next to a trail and we're ne next to a road. So there's actually a lot of open space and eventually the sun will hit it more or less directly. Otherwise, yeah, they're just reaching towards the sun, but they might not make it overall if they don't have enough sunlight that's direct. Okay. That's why they like that fire so much. That's the fire. That's such an interesting thing about fire too. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, I have a question actually, when you were talking about how they sort of start to self heal, you showed us that image. Do they have a sap of some kind or what's the healing process that occurs? Yeah. Great question. So sap is actually not so much healing. Um, but so I'll talk about that first and I'll talk about the healing. Sap is actually more to expel bugs from trees. So they're trying to basically drown bugs and push them out that way, or at least create sticky substance where they can't move. Giant sequoias pretty much have no sap because they have those tannins. Mm -hmm. um, and sap is actually very flammable. So it's another way, there's lots of other ways they're fire resistant, I didn't get to all of them, but that is another way that they're fire resilient, I should say. Maybe not resistant, but resilient. They're good at combating fire. Um, they don't have much sap in terms of their healing. I don't really know how else to describe it, except it's just like how you get a scab and then slowly you seal over the wound that way. It's just a slow process of them growing more and more wood to eventually seal it over. And it can take a very long time. So they will have basically an open wound that is that burn scar for a while. And that's okay. Overall, they'll just slowly grow over that wound. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. that does make sense. Thank you. That's, mm -hmm. it's just so amazing that they will do that. Mm -hmm. All trees do that, by the way. Not all of them are as successful as others, but all of them at least try to heal themselves. Um, not a great example, but if you've seen people carve their like, initials into a tree and all that, right. you will see that often the tree, if not covering it up, it'll at least fill in those cracks and it won't look as like fresh the carving was made yesterday if it was made a while ago. Don't you dare do that. No, never no. do that. <laughs> but the, all trees will in some way heal themselves. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's, that's good to know. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. And and you had mentioned again about the tannins. Um, there's a question. We were just talking about that again. It's more of a repellent. Um, and somebody asked, uh, do any other types of trees besides redwoods use tannins to protect themselves? Or is it every, is it, you might've answered this. I'm not sure. If, I didn't really, I kind of mentioned, so we have an incense cedar right next to me here. You can see it's kind of reddish. They have some tannins. Okay. Um, I mentioned there's a cedar bark beetle. So obviously there is an insect that can eat these guys. Plus now unfortunately giant sequoias, but does repel. And um, I don't know where y'all are calling in from. I'm guessing from California. We've ever been down to the South into the swamps. 
Uh, the cypress trees down there have tannins. Ooh. I've ever been to a swamp and he knows that the water is black. It looks like black tea. It's because there's so many trees in the water that the tannins are coming out of the trees and dyeing the water black. So oh yes. Oh my gosh. Okay. Okay. That's a different environment too. That's interesting. Yeah. Please go explore a swamp if you can. I think it's really cool environment and ecosystem. Uh, and you'll see some very distant relatives of the giant sequoias because cypress trees are related to giant sequoia trees. Oh, okay. Great. Okay. That's really great. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, I have a few comments and then this question, do giant sequoias ever grow from the roots of a giant sequoia rather than from a seed? Is that? That's a great question. Okay. No, coast redwoods do, uh, but giant hmm, sequoias okay. can't. So coast redwoods, if you cut down a coast redwood and you actually will see this in many locations across where coast redwoods were cut down, which is a lot of California, uh, they can use their roots underground to sprout basically clones of the mother tree. It's called a fairy ring. You'll see a ring of trees around either a stump or an empty space because it's been so long. And they can also sprout from a tree that was like pretty badly burned. Giant sequoias are seed only, which is another okay. not awesome way to do it. Coast redwoods have a leg up there for adaptations. Okay. That's very interesting. Okay. Um, and then somebody said that they were up actually at, at the park recently and they noticed that there was uh, there appeared to be fire damage and they were wondering if there was something recent that had caused that. Yeah, so I'm gonna share the prescribed burn picture again. It wasn't probably this one you were looking at. So oh, we okay. did two prescribed burns last year. We did this one, which hopefully you'll see in a moment. In May, uh, our burn boss, Ben, actually wished it was a little bit drier so things would catch a bit more because a lot of things just didn't burn they wanted to burn. But we also did one in the fall that was far more successful. There were a couple sections that are a bit more burned than he would have personally liked, but it's really hard to predict these things. Overall, that was a big success. So yes, so scattered throughout the North Grove, you'll see some burn marks. That's where our prescribed burns. For the most part, there's a couple burn marks from the wildfire we had well over 100 years ago. But if it looks fresh, we did in the fall and we did in May. And we're hoping to do it in about a month this year. Okay. Okay. That's great. That's right. You said it's yeah. a, good, a good year for it. So Yes, it's a great year for it. Our natural resources crew is very happy. Okay, great. I know we're starting to run out of time, but I wanted to um, mention before we run out of time, but I have several questions from people wanting to know, do you have these kinds of talks or reels on Instagram or other social media? And so um, the your whole Portscast program, I don't know, we've put a link yeah. in the chat. So I don't know if you wanna speak to that or. Yeah, I can speak to that. So if you've ever heard of Ports, it stands for Parks Online Resources for Teachers and Students. Um, I do about three programs a day three days a week for schools very similar to this except usually shorter and a bit more interactive in a sense um, and occasionally we do those not just for kids in classrooms but for everybody as webinars similar to this I will actually be doing one later this week but it'll be the same topic so you don't need to come <laughs> but it's called <laughs> ports casts so if you look up California State Parks ports and ignore all the boat stuff you're looking at um, you will see the ports webpage, or you can use the link that was put in the chat and then from there you'll see ports casts those are the free webinars for anybody. And we have well over 80 ports programs across the state you could choose from. Um, to me, the coolest ones we do are live dives where we have a scuba diver who is live under the water talking about what they're looking at, what it's like to scuba dive two people. So look at those. Um, it should be linked on that website, but if you can't find it, California State Parks Ports does have its own YouTube. And we also live stream those ports cats to that YouTube channel. Uh, you'll see some of my old videos there. You could look under either the live tab or the videos tab. YouTube changed it recently where if it's a live stream, it goes under live, even if it's not live now. And videos, if you're just uploading it directly. So look under both and you'll see programs from all over the state and you'll see my face as well doing some other programs. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. And I just want to really encourage people because a lot of people are, have really enjoyed this program to to check those out because we've watched them and it I mean it's all over the state the places yeah. that are doing the Point Lobos and just some really interesting topics that you guys cover so yeah yeah and um so I just wanted to um people are asking about how they can see more so I wanted that yeah to so put I'd that say out go, 
Yeah, go to the website first. But if you want something now, just check out that YouTube channel I mentioned, and there are hundreds and hundreds of hours of programming you can watch. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. Uh, we're almost out of time. Let's see. Um, more, more. Lily is awesome. Lily is okay. great. Thank you, Lily. Thanks for the interactive presentation. Okay, this is a question. I'm not sure you can answer this, but we'll, we're I'm going to put it out there. Is it true that pollen that comes off trees can make a golden wave in lakes? This is getting a little out there for you. Um, a golden wave in lakes? Is yeah, I saw question? golden waves and fallen leaf lake next to Lake Yes, Thomas, And my friend explained uh, that's what it was. Yes, absolutely. That can happen. Um, so we don't have any ponds or lakes here. We do have the Stanislaus River that cuts through our park and we have a couple creeks. So you don't really see that. However, if it's been raining and there's puddles and it's like roughly fall season when we get a lot of pollen, then you are going to see these yellow orangey rims around the edges, which is what you're talking about. And actually here I have some pollen bits on the ground here. I shouldn't quite say that, but this is the male part of the plants. They're doing their thing right now. So the cones I showed you are all female. These are male. Most of the trees here are both male and female, but they do their things at different times to make sure they're not like having their own kids, if you know what I mean. But this is the male part of the trees. So right now they're doing their thing. There's a little bit of pollen, but in general, well, different trees release their pollen different times. But if you are seeing a yellow mark around the edge of a lake, something like that. I definitely saw that this past spring. That is pollen. You are correct. Okay, great. Thanks. That was an interesting question too. Thank you for yeah. asking that. Okay. Um, here is a question. Um, is, is there a symbiosis between uh, the roots of, of the giant sequoia and, and fungi or fungus? Is there a fungus yes. that grows? Yes. Okay. Yes. So I was actually thinking about talking about this, but I wasn't sure I've had enough time. So now we do. Uh, yes, giant sequoia is just like, I think it's over 95% of all plants, at the very least 90%, have mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, how do you spell mycorrhizal? Look it up. <laughs> There's some C's and H's and things in there. The mycorrhizal fungi are so key to plant survival. They basically extend the roots of the plants they're living on top of, and it is a symbiotic relationship. It's a beneficial symbiotic relationship, so it's mutualism, if you want to get technical. And they will give the tree those extra resources by extending the roots more and the tree will give them sugar and maybe water if they need it whatever else they need and it also can act as a communication slash mail carrier system mm -hmm. it's not as much between two different kinds of trees so we have a incense cedar here and a sugar pine here but it could potentially happen where if this sugar pine is doing great and the incense cedar is struggling and they're okay with each other the incense cedar using its mycorrhizal fungi and using various pheromones it can excrete will release like stress signals. And then this tree, because they're intermingling their mycorrhizal fungi, can send this incense cedar water, nutrients, whatever it is. It's usually between the same species, but scientists have found it, maybe not in this forest, but in other forests between multiple kinds of species. And it's usually some big like mother tree supporting the species from far away that are the same that are struggling a little bit. Or it could also be a signal where it's like, hey, I'm getting attacked by beetles. And the sugar pine says, oh, okay, I'm gonna up my defenses and create more sap or something. Yes, great question. Uh, oh, that is, that's Love that it. could be a whole program. I mean, that's, yes. pretty, that's very interesting that they'll protect each other and help each other. Mm -hmm. wow. there, there are many really great books about it. So I do encourage you to look them up. A really famous one's called Entangled Life, I think, or Entangled Web, one of those. And it gets really into how important fungi is in forests like this. Oh, I better make sure we have that at the library. <laughs> Entangled with. Okay, great. And then this one, this is probably our last question. We're running out of time. And I want to thank everybody who's commented and, and attended. And Bradley will close us out. But here's one last question for you, Lily. Um, it says, I found a fungal conch. This might be related on a sequoia. What might that be? Does that... Do you know what a fungal conch is? I don't know what you're referring to specifically. Um, as far as I'm aware, I know that there is, so I said giant sequoias repel fungi with their tannins. There's always a caveat, right? Just like how the cedar bark beetles can get into giant sequoias with the tannins. There is a fungal issue on giant sequoia roots that can cause them problems. So there can be 
and bad fungi on the roots. I'm not sure this fungal conch you're talking about um, on the outside. So I can't really answer that for you. Uh, maybe it's this giant sequoia is growing a burl over it, which is its kind of protective way to say, hey, I'm going to grow over this thing so it can't get to the rest of the tree. But I don't really have an answer for you. Oh, so the burl would be like to stop it from growing or from... Yeah, yeah. so they okay. see lots of burls on a tree that usually means it's fighting off something. Oh, okay. That's very interesting. Okay, wow. Well, thank you. It, we've come to the end of our time with Lily and we're sad to see you go. Um, but we're so grateful to you and I, um, thank you for taking these questions and I'm going to toss it back to Bradley and have him close it up. But thanks again, Lily. We really appreciate it. Uh, thank you again to Lily Orovitz for this wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you to Mona Robinson for monitoring our Q&A and thank you all for attending. If you're ever in the area, please visit the State Library in person at 914 Capitol Mall in Sacramento, Monday through Friday from 9.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. And check out a California State Library Parks Pass and check out Calaveras Big Tree State Park and one of your other local California State Parks. If you enjoyed this webinar, please sign up for our two remaining webinars in our Resilient California series on October 12th. The State Parks will be discussing Colonel Allensworth State Historic Park about the historic California town founded, financed, and governed by African Americans. And also on October 26th, a webinar about the Tijuana River National Estuarine Research Reserve and tropicalization of the largest coastal wetland in Southern California. Thank you all for attending and have a great afternoon.